Henry Ford's spare time, he would experiment late into the night after years and years of sweat equity. He unveiled in 1896 something he called the quadricycle. Here it is. Yeah. He formed his own com company called the Detroit Motor Company. Never heard of that company? Well, he built it on his own dime, but it failed. The cost of new invention was too high, and the quality was too low. But he didn't give up, and he didn't, oh, government, can you help me? He didn't. He went to other entrepreneurs and other business people. His second attempt, the Henry Ford Company. That didn't work out either, really. He wasn't, no. but he still didn't give up. His third attempt was the Malcolm, the Malcolmson and Ford Company. Finally, Henry Ford got it right. The Ford Motor Company. He put together the Model T, and history was made. You see, we're a nation that feeds on the inspiration provided by others. Orville and Wilbur Wright, they're not the first people to ever attempt flying. They were inspired by the challenge and what other aviators were attempting. They risked finances, they risked life and limb, and they, they wanted to try. Others were trying and succeed. Remember, we think of North Carolina as the birthplace of flight, right? But actually, it is overlooked too often as the graveyard for countless models that failed. Let me show you the people that didn't fail. This is original documents from Orville and Wilbur Wright. We are so blessed to be able to show you some pieces of history here that it, just nobody sees, and we're just so blessed. We were at this amazing um, museum library on Friday, my whole staff, and most of us stood there for three hours just going, oh my gosh. And we want to thank the people who are letting us show you some of these things. This is an original letter here, and, a, and this is a, a picture at Kitty Hawk. And I want to read you this letter. It says, My brother and I selected a narrow strip of sand called Kill Devil Hill near the settlement of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. We arrived at camp on September 25, 1903. A succession of bad storms delayed the flight until December 17th, when about 10.30 in the morning, I made the first successful powered flight. Wilbur ran alongside, holding the wing to balance. There's Wilbur right there. To keep the machine on track until the 40-foot run, after a 40-foot run, it finally lifted. These are letters from Orville and Wilbur Wright describing what they did. By the way, this is just some of the stuff that we've been looking at to bring to Cowboy Stadium for you to see and we're not gonna we're not gonna bring this. It's we've got a couple of things that'll knock your socks off. This is enough, but this just the history of you know Orville and Wilbur Wright, you know, the first people that actually flew a plane. <laughs> what's the big deal on what's the big deal on that one, you know, really? Because a lot of people, anybody could have done it. No. No, actually, plane after plane, dream after dream, crumpled. Crumpled glider after clump, crumpled glider ended up like this. Death of fellow aviators fell from their model aircrafts because it didn't work. But that didn't stop the Wright brothers. Finally, on December 17, 1903, Wright brothers announced they had achieved the first man-powered and controlled flight in human history. But before we heap too much praise on the Wright brothers, maybe we should check with President Obama, make sure, were the roads or bridges? Were, were they there? Did they? Because uh, I don't see any bridges. I don't see any roads here, Mr. President. But I'm sure the roads and the bridges were there. And so the Wright brothers really didn't do anything different. I mean, we all would have been able to, if we all had the road, we all would have been able to do that. I spent my vacation a couple of weeks ago on the family farm. The family farm is 
uh, run by batteries. It's battery power. And let me tell you something. If you think electricity service is bad now, oh, you, you just better pray to God Almighty that the eco-freaks don't ever get their way because it'll put the U.S. back into dark ages of energy. Let me just say this. After the battery farm weekend, I have a whole new perspective on electricity. Thank you, Thomas Edison. Oh, no, no. No, I shouldn't thank Thomas Edison. I should thank another man. You see, Thomas Edison, he may, have, he may have started the ball rolling on a lot of different things. It was Thomas Edison who gave us the light bulb. Yeah, it wasn't him that created electricity. Thomas Edison started the process. He started the first public utility company, the Edison Illuminating Company. He gave us the phonograph, the sound, the motion picture, the light bulb. But this company that he created, it was just trying to capitalize on his inventions of, of this, the electric lamp. He was off and running. And by 1887, he had 121 power stations in the United States. What? 121 gigawatts. Yeah. He had these power stations, 121 of them, to provide electricity to homes. But Edison had one problem. His plants were all DC. That is short for direct current. It's used now for low voltage items. It's DC. It's a battery. It's what I had. This is what runs my home now. It sucks. He could only provide homes power if they were within a 1.5 mile radius per every power plant. That was it. You had to be close to the battery. One of Edison's employees, his protege, was a guy named Tesla. Now, Tesla, he believed he had the solution. He said it wasn't DC direct current. It was alternating current. It was AC. With, without getting technical here, AC made it possible to run, run electricity much farther distances without the need of a power plant every two miles. You could run it across the country. It's what we use now. It's what's in your wall. It's what's running your refrigerator, running your internet right now. But Edison, the private guy, dismissed the idea, said it's other, utterly impractical. Now, you couple that insult with the, with the fact that Edison allegedly cheated Tesla out of $50,000 he claimed he worked for. Edison said he was joking when he initially proposed the amount. He quit over that dispute. And he formed his own company. It failed. But he would rather work hard for a living than live a lie. He ended up digging ditches for work. But as he was shoveling, ideas kept churning. He never gave up on his idea. He finally got in front of an energy giant called Westinghouse. Westinghouse, he was an important man. In fact, I remember uh, growing up, Westinghouse, uh, Westinghouse light bulbs and refrigerators and everything else. Well, this relationship, Tesla and Westinghouse, really troubled Edison. Threatened, uh, threatened his whole power empire. Wait a minute, wait a minute. These former colleagues suddenly found themselves in a bitter war. Edison against Tesla. And Edison unleashed a propaganda campaign against AC power. You're not going to believe this. He traveled around with a demonstration that showed the supposed dangers of AC. Edison said DC was like a peacefully flowing river, while AC, it's a torrent of Russian violence. He eventually actually had a professor going around literally executing stray cats and dogs and lame horses to show how deadly it could be. He would strap electrodes to him and kill the horse in front of people. Can you imagine this? This professor even took a Westinghouse generator that was Tesla's partner and had the state use it in an execution of a prisoner on death row. This is how electrocution started. It was to, to shut Tesla down. The New York Times described AC as an awful spectacle, far worse than hanging. Edison then actually tried to get the phrase electrocuted changed to Westinghousing. Oh, you think capitalism is bad now. But government wasn't involved. 
You might remember some of this stuff if you've ever watched one of my, I love this, I shouldn't, but I do, I love it. Drunk history, have you ever seen this on the internet? Westinghouse and Tesla won the contract to supply all the electricity to the world's fair. And this pissed Edison off. He was like, Fuck this. Uh, alternating current is bad. Alternating current will only cause massive deaths. And so he started this campaign to prove the alternating current was like the worst current you could use. What he did is he began to like publicly electrocute animals. Edison was an he was like taking like sheep and being like, look what happens when the sheep touches the alternating current. Oh, it, blow, it gets electrocuted. Look what happens when a cow comes in contact with the alternating current. It dies. Tesla was horrified. And he'd be like, this is awful. I am inventing electricity and you look like an It's really a horrible way to tell history, but actually drunk history, it, it turns people on to history. It's, it's brilliant. So, despite the heavy propaganda, heavy lobbying, Edison had all the clout with the government because of his huge power companies. Tesla, I, his idea was so good that it started making its own headway. Westinghouse and Tesla finally won a bid they were going to illuminate the Chicago World's Fair. This was the first all-electric fair in history. Tesla ended up winning the War of Currents. You know, you had to re completely reinvent the light bulb for that World's Fair. Because Edison said, you're not taking any of my patents. Do that without my light bulb. And he did in like 18 months. But out of everything Tesla achieved, the most cherished accomplishment was this. Tesla said, becoming an American citizen. He understood what it meant to be an American. Americans are free to create. We inspire each other to push ourselves to new limits through competition. We're free to lead beyond our wildest exp uh, expectations and earn a living off that success. Because of our successes, we are honored with the privilege of loving and serving other people and lifting all men up. Tesla got it. Wouldn't it be nice to have a president who understood it as well? He doesn't. But that's why I say...